We're really sad at Broken Record to hear about the passing of Justin Towns Earl. We recorded an interview with him some time ago before the coronavirus put in-studio conversations on hold for us. Bruce Hedlund met up with him at GSI Studios in Manhattan. Justin played some music. They talked. As you'll hear, Justin was a gifted performer and songwriter. He was the son of outlaw country musician Steve Earl and got his middle name from his dad's mentor, Towns Van Zandt. Both Steve and Towns struggled with addiction, and so did Justin for most of his life. He talks with Bruce about his personal troubles in this episode pretty candidly, and their conversation about racial tensions in America seems prescient now. Justin identified with people on the margins. He wrote fantastic songs detailing fringe lives with tremendous heart. They were full of desperation, humor, and specificity in the best of the Southern songwriting tradition. We had this interview scheduled to run next month in September. When we heard yesterday morning that Justin passed over the weekend, we weren't sure we should run this at all. There's some really deeply sad moments in this conversation with Bruce. But there's also a lot of soul. So in the end, we thought you might all enjoy spending some time with Justin Towns Earl. His talent in life, for better or worse, really shines through. We also hope you spend some time with his music, whether you're returning to it or just discovering it for the first time. This is Broken Record, liner notes for the digital age. I'm Justin Richmond. Here's Bruce Hedlum with Justin Towns Earl. Justin Towns Earl with Flint City, Flint City Shake It? Flint City Shake It. Flint, all right. Yeah. Uh, that was quite an opening. Thank you so much. You got to start out fast, man. Yeah? Do you, you always know? start your concerts fast? I like to, you know. Yeah. Try to, you know. But, you know, you know, you have to, you got to give them something to see, right? Yeah. They ain't going to come out there and stare, you know, very few people can get that, uh, you know, the Jeff Buckley, you know, do that thing where you could stare at your shoes mm-hmm. um, and get away with it. He was great. I saw it live. I couldn't do that. Yeah. I, I like, I like the show to start. It's like, I don't want to see nobody come out on stage and tune. It's like, when I walk out, I want my guitar tuned for me mm-hmm. and hand it to me and let's, let's go. Um, so tell me about the writing of that song. Flint City Shake It. Um, well, you know, I think it, it it was the first song I wrote for this record. Mm-hmm. Um, and it kind of, it tied into this thing where I was looking at the way, you know how like Springsteen made New Jersey so cool. Sure. He made you feel New Jersey. Or before, who you know, but, but you know, you listen to him, you know, working on the highway and things like that. Mm-hmm. Like you... You you get this this mysticism about it and this thing where he made it romantic, made Jersey romantic. Yeah, that Bon Jovi sure as shit couldn't do that, you know. So what I wanted to do is take that same which he he's a Woody Guthrie disciple, right? Mm-hmm. Which I am too. I wanted to take that same idea, but apply it to all of America. So I have I, I wrote Flint City Shake It, um, then I wrote. Saint of Lost Causes. Then I wrote Appalachian Nightmare. Um, you know about Appalachia. Uh, I wrote Ahi Esta Mi Nina. You know about a, I, I based that on a, 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 a my my basis was a Puerto Rican kid from the East Village that from the alphabets who got locked up on mandatory minimums when he was young, oh. um, and was and got off a, a prison bus and met his daughter for the first time. That's what Ahi Esta Mi Nina is about. Mm-hmm. Um, but but it's like that's that the, the whole idea and it's like I wrote over Alameda about a kid from the Jordan Downs housing projects in South Central Los Angeles. It's a very old impulse in American music that I think has been lost. I mean, Springsteen wrote about very New Jersey, lost. Uh, but he you know he's from New Jersey. He wrote about other places as well. But oh yeah, what is it about those songs or those kinds of songs that that people like Woody Guthrie used to write? What do you think that I – mean, you say, like, you know, everybody's Americans, but but in a weird way, the beauty of those songs is it makes different parts of the country more mysterious, isn't it? Well, I mean, I think, too, is like – yeah, it's like I, – I mean, I hope that it makes it mysterious. I hope that it makes people intrigued by different parts of the country. I hope it makes somebody figure out that, like, you know, if you lived in L.A. from the 1940s until now – over Alameda, that was the dividing line. 
Mm -hmm. It was a dividing line between- Black and white. Was this, so Flint City was the first song on this album, Mm -hmm. on your new album. Was it, did it kind of set the tone for you with this album? Was it characteristic of what you wanted to do? Well, I always have um, a, a conceptual idea about my records, even from the start. Even from the good life, I had this I, this concept of it. Even though it's light, uh, like uh, my early records, they were light. Except Midnight at the Movies was pretty conceptual. I based that on Gregory Corso's uh, book Mind Fields, mm-hmm. um, Harlem River Blues. I based on Moving Here, things like that. But um, I know I um, I always know exactly where I want to start and where I want to end, and that goes with songs and records. Because, I mean, it's just like I'm not, you know, I'm not pissing in the wind. You know, it's like I'm here to, you know, I'm going to, you know, I'm if you want to be an artist, it's like I write about 12, 13 songs a year. They go on my records. I think um, uh, Saint of Lost Causes, the song, yeah, took me about six months to write. What did it start as? Did it start as a it was with a lick, with a lyrical idea? What? How did it? What was the genesis? It it, it started with this this idea of I was I was looking at it's like you know you are looking at people like Eric Gardner getting choked out by cops, uh, the Me Too movement, all these things of all these people like you know it's like we. we People, anybody, black people, Mexicans, you know, women, we've we've treated them like horribly over. And and so what I was trying to get at was the fact that if you keep poking at the underclass, what you call the underclass, the, you know, you keep poking at us. Eventually, we're gonna strike back, mm-hmm. and you won't like it. Okay. And so was it was it stuff in the news you're reading or stuff you were seeing up close that, that stuff started I've, the song? I've lived through stuff I've lived through. I mean, I mean, I, you know, it's like everybody. I'm Steve Earle's son, but my daddy was. I mean, my mom was number three of eight wives. You know, and he was gone before I was two. I grew up with my mother. I mean, I grew up on. You know what makes the best grilled cheese sandwich in the world? Government cheese. In the cardboard box, <laughs> the best damn grilled cheese sandwich you can get. And I know that because I grew up, you know, I grew up with my mother who worked three jobs. Um, I grew up with, you know, and I, I gravitated toward a lot of dangerous people. Um, I, uh, and I've, you know, I've always been a street level kind of person. Mm-hmm. I don't want to go to your martini bar um, and and sit there and, and bullshit. I want to go to the darkest, dimmest, most dangerous bar you got, and let's get down with the people. Right. Because that's how most people live. So that's where the song came from, That those memories, that idea? All of it, yeah. 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 Well, yeah. you said that's where you want to start with the album. Where did you want to go with the album? I uh, Well, what, what I wanted to go with was actually when I wrote Saint, Saint of Lost Causes, the song, mm-hmm. which we'll play next. Yeah. Um, I knew I was just like, okay, that's it. Now we got to add up to that. Is it something you map out very consciously or is it just very, a feeling? Yeah. Very. Yeah. So when you're writing the it's, next song, you're, you, you've I got usually, your last song in mind? I usually know where I want to end before I know where I want to begin. I mean, you just keep working until you finish the record. I mean, until you feel like you got to start. I mean, you got to finish. Mm-hmm. It's a thesis. You need a hard beginning, a middle, and an end. Yeah. And only the most pertinent information. <laughs> Are you that way as a lyrical writer? You say you've got a... Oh, shit. You ought to see my notebook. I mean, if somebody stole one of my notebooks, mm-hmm. um, you may get two songs because it's just page after page of just rewrites and rewrites and mm-hmm. rewrites. And, and I always write number two pencils uh, and steno pads. Mm-hmm. Always um, use the same kind of pad. Always, use always it. yeah, I like to. You one of? The, are you very precise in that way? Well, you know, I, well, I, the only thing that I, you know, the pad I like cinema pads. It ain't necessarily the pad ain't the thing, but the number two pencil is the thing. Okay, because you can erase it. Oh, when you get a bad idea, but you got to remember when you had a 
decent idea that maybe you didn't work out just right mm -hmm. and leave that and not erase it so you can go back and look at it and find another way to toy it around and and you know and get yeah. it right get I, it right I, that time I, I was reading this um biography of guy clark and they reproduced some of his notebooks oh. and it was sort of done impeccably and hardly any revisions, which kind of just stunned me. Maybe maybe they're just showing the good pages, well, not the messy pages. Well, no, he's the guy who told my dad, always write number two pencil. <laughs> was that right? And my dad told me, always write number two pencil. <laughs> yeah. So he erased everything that he didn't like. Oh, okay. <laughs> That's why. Yeah. All right. So you cover up your history. I'm I'm gonna You can, you can, you can but you can only but but you gotta always remember is like is like we can't all be as good as Guy Clark. So we have to hang on to what we're where we came from, you know. Sometimes you have to know what to hang on to, um, you know. Uh, keep two eyes on the ground, pick up what you find, but be careful what you keep. Why don't we hear "Saint of Lost Causes" and then keep talking? Let's do that. So, for people listening, wondering how many guitars are playing on that song, it's just you, just one guitar. But mm. you've got this very interesting way you. You strum and pick kind of at the same time. I call it sleight of hand. Okay. Um, I learned a bit of it from Malcolm Holcomb. Okay. It was yeah, great, great song. Sun House. Mm-hmm. Did this? I mean, they, this. Right. But wait, but you got to do is figure out this thing is like you know you got to you got to get your fingers bent. Like, <laughs> crazy. <Wow. laughs> you, I'm crazy. looking at some very bent fingers. Here. Very bent, and and this thumb looks like a canoe paddle. I mean, but but you get this. Well, the other thing I was going to say is, uh, and this isn't very common anymore, your stuff really swings. Oh, man, I, I swing like a pendulum. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's a, you got you got to swing. I mean, if you don't know how to shake your ass, then you. I mean, that's something. That, I mean, did you get that from Western Swing? What uh... I got that from the blues. I got that. I got that from the blues. I mean, I got that from listening to. Um, but you know, I got it from Stax. I got it from. Uh, I did. I got it from Hank Williams. But you know what? Where Hank Williams? Think about country before Hank Williams, right? It was just like. Oh yes, and we're going to this and, 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 and all on top of the beat. Right. Not that it wasn't good, but it was all on top of the beat. Hank Williams goes down to the Louisiana Hayride, and somehow, you know, everybody's like, "Oh, Hank Williams did this." It's like all he did was introduce the twelve-bar blues to country music. Mm -hmm. You know, or before it'd be like, "I'm going down to the river and I'm going," nah, 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 nah. but Hank Williams comes in and goes. I'm going down to the river, gonna dig my, you know, it's like, boom, drop back, sit back, relax. Right. Relax. I mm -hmm. mean, relax about it. it but some some of your earlier songs, like I'm thinking uh, The Good Life, the song, that oh, yeah. was very Western swing. Oh, yeah. No, no. I mean, Western swing was was definitely a part of of, of what I love, but but it was, it was weird how I got into, like, I'm not, I'm not, um, it's more like when I think about Western Swing, I, I think about Moon Mulliken. You know uh, these 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 stranger uh, Emmett Miller. Mm -hmm. um, I think of these these different things. I'm, Emmett I'm, Miller, who wrote uh, Love Sick Blues, he wrote the Love Sick Blues, and and you know what? Hank Williams definitely saw Emmett Miller when he was down in Louisiana. Is that right? Without question, where, where and, the and hell? Mill Edwin Miller did. He did Ragtime. I think he was. Ragtime. Well, I mean, he was a blackface performer. He was a white guy who painted his face black and performed in blackface, old minstrel show kind of thing. Yeah. Um, and people don't really know how, because it's so politically fraught, how influential a lot of minstrel show music well, was. I mean, here's the deal. It's like if people need to understand this about what the minstrel show did. The minstrel show, for the first time, um, before it's like you lived in a holler somewhere, or you lived in a bio somewhere, you lived on a ranch somewhere, or even if you lived in a city, you knew a version of a song because your uncle knew how to play it, and he played it on Saturday night when y'all gathered together, you know, for your you know your gathering. So everybody knew these different versions, like 
nobody's versions were the same, right? This was before records were made, right. you know? So it's like nobody knew the same versions. For the first time, the minstrel show travels. It travels, and it introduces America to a uniformed song. Like, the, the, uh, the, the, that's how you play that song, you know, that idea. You know, it was the very first widespread given to all of America at the time music that we had. Before radio. Before radio, before records could be made. Mm-hmm. Um, and I mean, and of course, there's, there's, there is always going to be this, uh, uh, this, this stigma about it because, you know, even black people had to paint their face black to be yes. in a minstrel show, you know, mm-hmm. right? Hell yeah, that's fucked up. Yeah, I mean, it, what minstrel, what the minstrel show did for American music, we would not have American music the way that we have it if it was not for the minstrel show. Mm-hmm. We wouldn't. Do you remember the first song you wrote? Mm. I do. Um, uh, halfway to Jackson. So the first song you ever wrote in life ended up on an finished. Album? Yeah. Well, a lot of the songs on on the Good Life. Yeah. A couple of them. Um, I wrote um, "Halfway to Jackson" when I was fourteen. Uh, Ain't glad I'm leaving. When I was fifteen. Uh, uh, Turn out my lights. When I was fifteen. Uh, Rogers Park. Turn out my lights. When I was could be a George seventeen. Jones song. What were you What were you listening to back then that that helped you write those songs? Um, those songs were, were back then, like, I mean, those were the few, like there's, I can't remember all the songs on that record, but those were the few that were the old songs that I'd had since I was a kid when, because I was 25 when, when, when New Life came out. So the, those were the ones that lasted, right? I wrote a ton of shit back then, like, but when I was a teenager, tons, tons, and a lot of it's embarrassing as hell, but you got to go through that. You know, you got to write bad songs, try them out. I mean, and I, I mean, it's not like you know. I used to write a song, and you know, I'd like run down to Dad's studio when he'd be working, like run down and be like, "Hey, look at this." He'd be like, "Yep, go back to the drawing board, son." He was hard as hell on me about it. Yeah, because you, how old were you when you started playing with his band? Uh, I was f- fifteen. Wow. What did you see of the music business when you were fifteen? On the road, I knew it was better than selling dope and going to prison, yeah. which was, which was what I was going to do. I was going to mm-hmm. follow my, you know, mom's side of the family down, down the rabbit hole. Right, I'd be dead or I'd be in prison. Mm-hmm. Period. And you know what? If this ever ends, I can't make no money. I'll probably end up in prison. <laughs> <laughs> I mean. Uh, because I only know two ways to make money. Okay. Only one's legal. All right. <laughs> uh, we're going to help you with this way because, uh, you know, of course you get three square meals. I mean, I, as long as you you know how to get your, you know, you can get your Zuzus and Wham Whams, I mean, you know, you, you, you'll be fine. So I'm kind of wondering this because, you know, particularly with music, a lot of music is is pop music and rock music is born in rebellion. When you have a father who's kind of such a rebel himself – how do you rebel against that? How did you how did you separate yourself from your father's influence? Um you can't. And you don't. Because if you try to if I said Steve Earl had no influence on my songwriting and that he wasn't one of my heroes as a songwriter, that would be the biggest I mean the biggest lie I could tell. You know, was that the case when you were 14? Well, we kind of just started getting to know each other when I was 14. <laughs> you, know? you knew his music, though. Mm. Of course. You know, but I, you know, it's an interesting thing. I mean, you have to realize that, like, any of those sons and daughters of, they're like, I don't want nothing. Don't talk about my dad. I want nothing to do with my dad or my mom. It's like, the fuck you think you are? And it's like, you. It's like you, you, you have to find your own way into this. Nobody can tell me that I rode my daddy's coattails into this fucking business because my dad can't play like me. Um, I can't write like him and he can't write like me. 
Mm. We have a different. I mean, we've we've we have distinct things that we do differently. Um, but and you know, and we've done since. I mean, sh- sh- shit. Like uh, since I started making records, I think we've done five shows together. What's that like when Period. you play together? Five shows though. Yeah, but what's it like when you play together? It's 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 something else. You want to see two Earl's butt heads? <laughs> Holy shit! I mean, it is. It's something else. Especially when we start playing together and I was doing songs together and uh, I, uh, I always like to take one of his songs that he likes to do and I, like play one of his songs that I know he's going to play just so he can't do it <laughs> <laughs> and things like that. But no, it's, it's definitely, it's a, it's a head button thing. But I remember, I remember the first time, you know, my dad telling me, go back to the drawing board. I mean, I used to play from noon until 7 p.m. at the spring water in Nashville. Uh, every Thursday, um, noon until 7 p.m., just playing and playing and playing and playing uh, covers and songs that I I wrote. But you know, it's like he, you know, I had to get that get 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 that test in. Get you had to build all that up. Had to build all that up. Um, and um, I wrote a lot of songs. And he said, "Go back to the drawing board." But I remember uh, the first time I, when I wrote Maria. Uh, I can't remember what record it's on. I think it's on Midnight or something. I can't I fucking remember. But when I wrote Maria, it was he came and saw me at um, Radio Cafe in Nashville, um, and we I was with my band The Swindlers at the time, and we played Maria last. And when I came off stage, my dad goes, well, "Hey, what was that Elvis Costello song you you played?" I said, "We didn't play an Elvis Costello song." He goes, "The last song." I said, "That's Maria." I was like, "That's mine." Mine. He goes, really? And I went, hell yeah. That was the first, like, oh, really? I was like, yup, duh. And, 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 you know, and, and I still can make him cry with Mama's Eyes. Mm-hmm. Can you play the first two bars of Mama's Eyes? Cause that's pertinent to this conversation. Oh, wait, wait. Let's see. Um, I have to do a little, a little bit of tuning for a second. But when I wrote this song, I mean, like, it, it was like, you know, it's like you got to be ballsy, you know? And I love the fact that when I came up with that first line that, you know, you know, that like right there, when I did that, I was just like, I, when I came up, I was just like, hell, I'm onto something. Yeah. <laughs> I'm onto something. Uh, what did he say when you f- he first heard that? He actually, uh, uh, the first time he saw it was at a, a show. Um, he came and saw him. Um, I can't remember where we were. Uh, oh, the Ryman. We were at the Ryman Auditorium opening for uh, Old Crow, I think. And Dad shows up, and, you know, like proud Papa on the sides, and <laughs> and I do do Mama's eyes, and and you know, and you can see. I mean, I you know, I kind of peek over and like you see him shrink a little. And uh, and after after the show, I was just like, uh, okay. he was like, hey, great show. He's like. Mama's eyes is a really fucking good song. It was a bit, there was this resignation in it. He was just like, <laughs> so I think that it's it. I found this thing in speaking the truth, uh, telling it the way that it is, mm-hmm. um, and he respects that absolutely because he he created me, even yeah. though he wasn't there for that for a good. Well, part that of your creates years. a lot of a boy. I'm a boy that doesn't grow up with a father. Mm-hmm. It grows up alone. Uh, you know, a mother that works three jobs, uh, who's, who's molested, beaten and abandoned, you know, after dad left, you know, what you think that ain't going to shape. Mm-hmm. You know what? You're, you're, I was pissed at dad for a long, it took us a long time to have a relationship. Long time. You read a lot about, uh, mothers. You, you wrote an album, single mothers, absent, absent fathers. fathers. Uh, you've got another one on this album. The um, Nina song. Oh, Ahi to Me Nina. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, that was like, that's a dad getting off, uh, you know, Ami Esmeralda, he was a sight for sore eyes. I'm just off the bus from Clinton. They put me out on the Bowery. I'm on my way home to see mommy now. Fancy seeing you along the way. Don't No, don't go. Ain't you got a minute for your old man? Let me buy you something to eat. Just a cup of coffee from the bodega. I was hoping we might get a chance to speak, you know. Um, and that was someone you 
new. That's based on. It's based on. It's a composite of of, of a few people that I knew. Uh, I lived in the alphabets for years, and um, I mean, people who I mean, don't don't nobody needs to be mistaken by anything. It's like alphabets are still strongly Puerto Rican, right? You know, and the influence there is 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 something else. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, and, and but that whole idea of like 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 you know the the uh, Puerto Rican people came here in the 1950s, started filling into this town um, as soon as they could, looking for a better life. They uh, speak great English. They speak Spanish between each other. But when you're talking to them, the only time that they, if you're if you're talking, just like you know, sitting at the bar talking, you know, with, with them, and it's like a bunch of non-Spanish speakers, they're talking perfect English. But you know, they you know hit their thumb. Uh, oh, chingale, punta madre. You know, so it's like emotional things that makes this, right? You know, this this thing come up. So, and I got this idea. I got Ariesta mi niña, my only child. Arras mi niña, you know. Now you have no fear of you're taking the the voice of a Puerto Rican father. Mm-mm. Uh, you take the voice of a African American kid mm-hmm. in Alameda. Uh, you know, there's a lot of controversy about that now. We're all Americans, but we're all Americans. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's the thing. Is like everybody needs to get the get the fuck over all that. Like. We're Americans, and and you know what? It's like, uh, you know, all the all the Puerto Rican kids that I knew when I lived in the alphabets mm-hmm. weren't born in Puerto Rico. They were born in America. They may speak Spanish. Their mom may cook some spicy food. I lived in the five twenty eight. Oh man, you should have smelled that building in the middle of the day. Oh shit! All the doors open and the cooking going. It was good, but the deal is, is they're Americans. Right, but a writer could say to you, "Yeah, but you're a white American. You've got a certain experience." Uh, well, well, but, but say, I, I grew up as a black kid in that neighborhood. I see it a different way. What, what is it like to take on that voice? Well, then? don't don't make sure that you think about it before you say it. I don't think I say anything that would offend mm-hmm. anybody in those songs. I mean, I, I may offend corporate America, but I ain't going to offend a Puerto Rican with "I Yes to Menina." I'm not going to. Uh, offend uh, any black man with over Alameda. Why don't we hear uh, your next song first? No. Is, what are you going to no, play? <laughs> <laughs> no, I got it. We'll do Frightened by the Sound. Okay. Oh, yeah. I mentioned before some of your songs could, they could have been Merle Haggard songs, George Jones songs. That could be a Paul Westerberg song. <laughs> it's got I love a... that. like I mean, like when when I recorded "Can't Hardly Wait" on, my, on, on Midnight at the Movies, it's on Midnight. Oh, that's at the right, movies. you did, yeah, yeah. And it, uh, it was a, we, we and should it, say Paul Westerberg, writer for the replacements. The replacements great, for great. all you people who don't know, look it up. You got your head in your phone. So the song you just played, "Frightened by the Sound," where you know you talked about kind of the arc of this album, where you started, where you ended up. Where is that along that line? Um. It's it's um it's just telling telling everybody that you know uh just don't 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 be afraid when the storm starts mm-hmm. and it will. But it's kind of a scary. It's funny because you're saying don't be afraid. It's kind of a scary song. It is. Yeah. But I mean, but it's like, but what really? What can we be scared of these days? I mean, if you're if you're really in this day and I mean, I mean if you're my age at least, right? I grew up through the crack cocaine epidemic, the inter- the the introduction of, of of assault rifles to the streets, carjackings, um, two bushes, Re- Reagan, two bushes, uh, and 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 now 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 Trump. Mm-hmm. What are you going to be afraid of? I mean, you we better be you. We better get this is a we better get tough. We better get tough. Um, and realize that there's, uh, you know, what what's, what's there to be scared of? I mean, the worst thing that can happen is you die. Well, there's that. I mean, and it's over. What you got to worry about then? <laughs> Don't be afraid of something. That <laughs> Are you, what's your life as a musician now? Is it, because I looked at your schedule, you tour a lot. I tour a lot. I'm, you know, I'm, 
I'm a good dad. Mm-hmm. I'm a terrible husband. Um, but I'm really good at what I do for a living. I know how to live on the road. Yeah. Um, I know how to do the shows. I know how to be tits and teeth. Uh, you know, the show goes on, get it done. Um, go. Um, but what I can't, I'm bad at. Get me off the road for a week, two weeks. I want to beat my head against the porcelain. Just, I mean, like it, it drives me insane. You I like just, being on the road. I don't know how it works. I mean, I'm, I don't know how it works. I've been doing this since I was 14 years old. Mm-hmm. I've been touring since I, I mean, touring, touring since I was 15. I mean, like what? What else do I know? Um, you know, my wife is like. You're messy. I was like, I'm sorry. I'm used to hotel rooms. I'm gone the next day. My, my problem, like, like, you know, it's like I'm, you know, I'm bad at it. My dad was never good at it, you know. Yeah. But but we committed to this. We, you know, this is the thing. It's like anybody who wants to be around me, be with me, is understand that this is what I do. That's what I'm gonna do. I I do not want to die at home. I want to die in a tour bus years from now, but I do not want to <laughs> die sitting on my damn couch. You know, you're not in Nashville anymore. You grew up in East Nashville, but... I didn't grow up in East Nashville. Oh, I thought you did. No, 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 no. I grew up in South Nashville. The only time we went to East Nashville is when our cousins got out of prison uh, and our aunt was having a cookout. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, this is one of the things that obsess people in country music. What's your relationship to Nashville? What's Nashville doing? What's the Nashville sound now? How do you look at what's coming out of Nashville now? Well, um, there's a lot of cool stuff coming out of Nashville right now. Um, but I got, I hate the bro country shit. Mm -hmm. I hate it. I mean, the, most of the stuff coming off music row, uh, is, is, I mean, I, I would, I mean, it's horrible. I mean, horrible. Um, but there's there's a lot of cool stuff that goes on in Nashville. You mentioned bluegrass, and there's a there's a terrific song in your album, which is uh, there's many terrific songs. The one that really stood out for me was Appalachian Nightmare. Oh yeah. Which is, uh, and you say you don't want to sing it because it has too many words. I can't remember the fucker. Yeah, I can't. Yeah, it's got a lot of words. It's got a lot of fucking words. Uh, but it's it's a kind of it's an outlaw song. It's not quite a murder ballad. No. But it's an outlaw song, which has got a – that's something else. It's got a real pedigree in, in – And country, in, yes. In much older music. Like well, you know, that family. that was one of the few songs that I did take kind of like when I was writing that, when I – when I got to the end, I was like, I'm, I'm going to make this guy kill a cop, and I'm not going to say it in the song. Mm-hmm. I suggest it. Was there a particular story you were thinking of – with the new one, Appalachian Nightmare, was there? Was it a news event or something, or was it just from your imagination? No, no, it's from friends. It's from friends. I lived in I lived in uh, Johnson City, Tennessee, for a while, mm-hmm. um, up around Pokey, Tennessee. Mm-hmm. Um, and what goes on up in those hollers? I mean, is it's something else. I mean, it's a it's a world onto itself. That um, it's a. I mean, I mean, I know a place, Butler Holler. Like in the '90s, and Butler Holler up, up around uh, Pokey, Tennessee, they the police wouldn't go down Butler Holler. They wouldn't go down the road. There was one road in, one road out. Yeah, and it was just like it was just trailers like tilted on these. But it was you know meth cooking, pill snorting. Like I mean, I remember there was this great robbery, and we were living in I was living in uh, Johnson City. This was a I mean I remember this because it's amazing. These two guys evidently pull up in front of a drugstore in downtown Johnson City on a dirt bike. <laughs> One of them has a 50-gallon garbage can, and they both have some kind of assault rifle strapped over their shoulders. They go in, you know, motorcycle helmets on, 50-gallon garbage can, you know, stick it up, and like fill it and just rake everything, all the pills, everything into that 50-gallon garbage can, run out get back on the bike, take it, and they put a strap around themselves. Right. And right as they were pulling out, the cops got on them. So they took off of 87, took up Unicoi Highway, 
And at that point, Unicoi Highway wasn't finished. It ended. <laughs> and it was just like a bridge that just stopped. The cops were following them. Boom! Dirt bike just right off that bridge. Up the hills. Gone. Yeah? Gone. Wow. <laughs> they couldn't follow them. They couldn't do nothing. <laughs> that was smart as hell. That's some hillbilly mm-hmm. ingenuity, if you yeah. tell me. <laughs> but, you know, you wait about four months, and then the town was flooded with pills. <laughs> right. Uh, are those stories still... You still want to tell those kind of stories? Yeah, because they're real stories. I mean, I mean, if we really think that most people, uh, uh, I mean, most most people in America ain't got a pot to piss in, and and who are we to tell them? You know, I, I do what I do to support my daughter. I don't care what happens. Mm-hmm. I'm going to do what I got to do. And I think they think the same way. You're going to do what you got to do. Our hearts go out to the friends and family of Justin Towns Earl. You can hear his last album, The Saint of Lost Causes, by checking out our playlist at brokenrecordpodcast.com. And be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash brokenrecordpodcast, where you can find extended cuts of past episodes and also new ones. Broken Record is produced with help from Leah Rose, Jason Gambrell, Martin Gonzalez, Eric Sandler, and is executive produced by Mia LaBelle. Thanks to our CEO, Jacob Weisberg, and our president, Malcolm Gladwell. Broken Record is a production of Pushkin Industries. Follow us at Pushkin Pods and the Broken Record Pod on social media. And if you like Broken Record, please remember to share, rate, and review our show on your podcast app. I'm Justin Richmond. Peace. Peace.